OK, Google. So what's next? At Okado Technology, we could answer robots and AI. Here are some of our robots. And here is one of our huge uh, warehouses full of robots running to pick up goods to fulfill thousands of orders per day. You might wonder, who is Okado now? Okado has been an online retailer in UK since 15 years. As a customer, you can go to our uh, website or our app to place your order. We can help you do so by recommending some of your regular products or new ones. And maybe one day, a self-driving car will reach your home. But meanwhile, thousands of pickers and drivers are working to make this happen. Okado is also now more than just a retailer. It's also a tech company, robust enough to uh, share its technology. So uh, we can um, uh, share with you, if you are a retailer, from the website and the app to the full system of delivery uh, using our fully automated warehouses and more big data and AI. Some of the biggest retailers in the, in the world are uh, already with us on this adventure, like Morrison's in UK, Bonpreu in Spain, Casino in France, Sobeys in Canada, Ica in Sweden, and Kroger here in the United States. Okay, now let's jump to some examples of uh, machine learning and AI that can help this online retail business. Product recognition. For now, uh, our pickers or robots need to find where the barcode of the products are in order to identify them for picking. Using image recognition, we could speed up this process and improve its accuracy by just bypassing this problem of needing to find where the barcode is. And there is more. With such technology, we could also provide to the customer the, uh, the possibility to just take photos of the products they want to add to their baskets. Another example of machine learning that can be used is for demand forecasting. To deliver thousands of orders per day properly, we need to anticipate the demand. How many orders will be pay, pay, placed every day? That can change on, on, during the week, the weekend, uh, during holidays, or more especially uh, on Christmas. And if you can also more precisely predict how many products of each kind will be um, demanded every day, you will also better anticipate the, the supply chain. And in this kind of problems, machine learning can help. Third example, product recommendation. Have you run out of some of your regular products? Would you also like some complementary products with the one in your baskets? Would you rather like one product instead of another one? Machine learning can help. And the last example that we will uh, detail more into this presentation is a classical problem that we face in online retail that is uh, fraud detection. Orders uh, being delivered but never paid for, or uh, being delivered, paid for, but then the, the money is uh, required back, and this is called chargeback, and this happens in general when the credit card used uh, was a stolen one. Okay. Now let's enter uh, into more detail into this fraud detection problem and start setting the context. Okado Retail in UK is more than 50,000 products, more than 650,000 customers, more than 250,000 orders per week. So imagine you only have one failed payment out of 1,000 orders. This already means losing millions of dollars. On the other hand, if you can improve just by a few percentage your fraud detection uh, system, you can save tens of thousands of dollars. With one big warning, false positive, if you predict that one order will be fraudulent and it's not because it's a regular customer, this high, has a higher costs because uh, a regular customer that uh, will stop uh, buying with you is a lot of possible future orders that you are losing, and not just one, and possibly some fame. And so I told you, now we have on board much more retailers from all around the world. So this number just multiply. OK, so how can we face this kind of problem of fraud detection? Historically, we have been using a set of handmade uh, rules 
um, set of rules, like for example, if you place uh, more than three orders for the future for more than 500 uh, pounds, and you let us less than 24 hours for the delivery, well, your order is risky. You combine a lot, a lot of rules like that, you give a score that gives a, a, a risk potential of your orders. So this, this kind of, of system is based on intuitions, human intuitions. Human can in general uh, define 10, 20, 30 rules based on 10, 20 features. Each rule is based on one, two, three, four conditions. And in general, it's kind of fixed set of rules. Other possible approach is machine learning. You, def you, you derive features from your incoming orders, like how many past orders of the customer, what's the total amount uh, of your uh, basket, what's the time between the order and the delivery, and you pass all these feature along with the uh, known class of failed payment or not to a machine learning algorithm that will learn a model that will then be able to predict if a new incoming order will be associated with failed payment or not. This system is based on data instead of intuitions and can handle much more rules, much more features, much more condition on rules, and it is adaptable. You can relearn uh, regularly your machine learning model, and uh, it will take into account the last behavior of fraudster that can evolve um, with time. Okay, so uh, we run some analysis on the different machine learning algorithm available. And I put here on uh, two axes the results that we, we have is on the uh, vertical axis is uh, the predictive performance of uh, the, the models. And XGBoost, like many times in Kaggle competition and, and, and in real life, XGBoost is reaching the best predictive performance. And then TensorFlow Neural Network has also uh, interesting results. And I put on the horizontal axis another uh, aspect that is important in fraud detection, that is explainability. If your algorithm can explain why he thinks that one order is fraudulent or not, for example, because the, the content of the basket is, is, uh, is, is not uh, normal, or if the payment methods um, used uh, uh, seems uh, suspicious, uh, it will help the human. And if you want to uh, use this machine learning algorithm to make automated decisions for legal reasons, you need to be explained why he rejected one order. So obviously, on this second aspect, the handmade rules are the, the, the best. It's uh, more understandable for humans. But the rule induction algorithms are really close. Decision tree also are understandable, but sometimes the depth of the tree is, uh, is too high for a human to really apprehend it. OK, and here is an important thing. I am a data scientist. I know quite a lot about machine learning, neural networks, how to cluster data, deduplicate data, how to face an unbalanced class problems, how to configure parameters of neural networks or others. But I don't know quite anything about machine settings, networks, topology, clustering machine, replicate data, load balancing, configure server. So the main question here is, how can I now go from my big data lying in some data lake into a fully automated pipeline of machine learning, serving predictions for fraud detection in production, hopefully easily and quickly, but most importantly, scaling, and with no need to set up a lot of machines and containers and auto-scaling processes, etc. With one uh, main constraint that is real time. Fraudsters don't lose time. If they steal a credit card, they will try to use it to place five orders for a high amount and for short notice. So imagine we have a model that just used two features, how many past orders for the customer and how many future orders for the customer. At training time, it's easy. We, are, we have uh, the access to all data. We can derive the feature from the input, pass it to the machine learning model algorithm that will learn a model. At serving time now, it can be more complicated. The number of past orders can be something that has been pre-computed and exposed to get the information directly at, at uh, real time. The number of future orders uh, can be more complicated because since the, the fraudster can place a lot in real time, you need to be closer to real time. So you need one set of features 
pre-computed, another one uh, in real time, and combine them to uh, provide as input to the machine learning model exactly the same as, as training time. So tell me, Przemek, do you have some uh, good solution to handle my problems and maybe with some Google tools? Uh, thank you, Laurent. I will try to do just that. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. And we will now see how we can implement the solution for a fraud detection problem using Google Cloud Platform. And of course, as Laurent said, we would like it to be as easy as possible. So let's do this. But first of all, I would like you to imagine where we want to be at the end of the journey. What's, uh, what are the actual physical components that, are, that will be in play here? So on the left side here, uh, what you can see is order management microservice. Okada Smart Platform is powered by hundreds of microservices like this. Each of them has very clearly defined responsibility. And here, as the name suggests, order management deals with orders being placed. This service, when the, when the order is being placed, would like to know whether this order is fraudulent or not. So what it will do, it will consult other microservice. Let's call it fraud service. By sending it customer ID and all details about the order, and what it would like to get in return is what is the probability of this order being fraudulent. And the fraud service is uh, actually the component that we are trying to build. So please keep this image in mind so this is where we are heading to. Um, what if you've never done machine learning project? How would you even uh, start? Where do you begin? So of course, there is no machine learning without data. You need a fair amount of history to be able to learn uh, patterns from uh, the behaviors of your customers. To do that, you need the right set of tools to store and process the data. And since we're talking about Google plat Cloud Platform, uh, there is a really good uh, analytical database that we would like to use, and it's Google BigQuery. We as Ocado store all our data in BigQuery, so it's, uh, it's petabytes of data actually, and BigQuery scales to this amount seamlessly. Uh, the other thing that we really like about BigQuery is that how fast it is. We can write SQL queries, uh, run them over terabytes of data, and still get results in terms of minutes or even seconds. The other good thing is that it doesn't require you uh, to have a separate DBA team to manage BigQuery. You just load data into BigQuery, you run queries, and that's all that is there. And the last thing that uh, kind of sold BigQuery to us is the pricing policy. And BigQuery, you pay for storage, and in terms of SQL queries, you pay for the amount of data those queries have read. So it's a very uh, fair policy, and it really helps us to um, control the cost that we uh, spent on doing analytics. And there are two questions remaining. So we decided that we want to use BigQuery as a main storage. So the first question is how do we actually load the data in BigQuery? And the one which is even more fundamental, what data do you land in BigQuery? So in the data lake, you would like to store all the data, but what all means in this case? So the rule of thumb that we use in Okada, which is really working very well for us, is that when there is any change to the business state of the application, you should send, or rather the micro, your microservice responsible for that business state should send an event to a distributed queue which corresponds to the change. When we gather all this data, the small deltas, then when we go back in time, you are able to see what was the exact state of the whole system at any particular point in time. So here uh, is the diagram of the ingestion pipeline. On the left, you see all those microservices that I told you about. They are actually running in uh, Amazon Web Services. And we use Google, uh, sorry, AWS Kinesis for a distributed queue. Then there, there is a question, how do we transport data from a distributed queue to BigQuery, and we wrote a streaming application 
using Apache Beam and Google Dataflow, which is running 24-7, and it's uh, moving the data in real time. And then we use streaming inserts into BigQuery to store this data. If you don't know what Apache Beam or Google Dataflow is, let me spend uh, a few minutes on uh, telling you more about this. For that, uh, I will use a toy example. Uh, let's imagine uh, you have a collection of words. Maybe you took a Shakespeare novel and you split it to have an each word that uh, is in, in this novel. And you would like to count how many of those words start with a letter A or letter B, C, etc. If you were to write this using, for example, uh, Java streams, you would probably write a snippet like the one on the top. You would first extract first character out of each word, group by this character, and then for each group count the amount of items in this group. And in Apache Beam, it's very similar. You uh, just write very, uh, exactly the same transformations. You have a map which extracts first character out of the word, you group by, and then you count. And Apache Beam is just a programming model for transforming the data. It kind of like a Java streams, because how it actually executes, it's dependent on JVM in case of Java streams. And it's the same with Beam. You just write this code, and how you execute it, it depends on the execution framework that you choose. And there are plenty of execution frameworks that you can choose from, ranging from Apache Apex to Apache Gear Pump. The one that we use is Google Dataflow, mostly because it's well integrated with other uh, Google Cloud services, but it's also uh, semi-managed. You still have control over um, machines, configuration, but most of the time you just write the Java code, you upload to Google Dataflow, and it just runs. Great, we have all our data in BigQuery. So the next step that Laurent or anyone working on machine learning algorithm would do is probably to go there and explore what's data available. You need to see what are the distributions of different variables, uh, how, they, how different tables join with each other. You can ask different questions uh, about your data. For example, you can ask uh, whether people that have a lot amount of alcohol in the orders are more likely to be fraudsters than the other people. And a really great tool to do that exploratory analysis is BigQuery because uh, first of all, we already have data there. It has a web UI where you can just go type a query and get a result fast. And based on the result, you can formulate another query and iterate, iterate, uh, to the point where you have all the answers for to your questions. If you need to do more uh, deep analysis, maybe plot some charts, share the results with uh, another people, uh, there are other tools in Google Cloud Platform that allow you to do that. One I would like to mention is Google uh, Data, uh, Data Lab, where you ha which is basically a hosted Jupyter notebook. You write a Python code there, you can extract data from BigQuery. You can plot charts with whatever uh, libraries that are, uh, are available in Python environment. You can use Pandas. You can use Scikit-learn. You can use Plotly, whatever you want. And there is also another tool from Google called Google Collaboratory that you see here, which is kind of taking this idea of notebooks one step further. So in Google Collaboratory, the Jupyter notebook is just a file on Google Drive. And you can do whatever you do with such a with Google Drive files with a Jupyter notebook here. So you can share it. You can put comments in here. Many people can collaborate on the same notebook at the same time. We use it a lot in Ocado, especially for doing reviews on notebooks. And we find it very handy. At this point, we are ready to jump into ML. We will do a feature engineering, so we'll extract uh, meaningful information out of raw data and will train a model. But first, which model do you choose? Here's the slide that Laurent already showed you, uh, and Laurent told you that there are two things that we care about. One is accuracy on the y-axis, and the other one is explainability, which you can see here on the x-axis. But to be honest, there is 
also a third dimension here, which we need to take into account, and this is how easy it is to deploy those solutions to the cloud. Google Cloud Platform offers you a cloud machine learning. This is a service that was first designed to train and serve neural nets written in TensorFlow. Uh, how this works exactly? You write your TensorFlow code, you package it into a Python package, you put it on Google Cloud Storage, and then you just call a cloud machine learning API. You say, here is my package with TensorFlow, here's the input data, please train a model for me. And then the trained model is just another file on Google Cloud Storage. So then you can point cloud machine learning to this model and you can say, please serve it for me. So what cloud machine learning will do, it will create a REST endpoint that you can call in real time. You just give it all the features and you get predictions back. Some times ago, Google announced that cloud machine learning will support other, other algorithms except of TensorFlow. So there is a support for serving XGBoost and scikit-learn models. Unfortunately, there is no way to train them yet on the cloud. And of course, you can use CPUs, GPUs for training, uh, all this stuff. So to sum up, the neural networks are now really easy to deploy to the cloud thanks to cloud machine learning. It's not so easy when it comes to XGBoost and scikit-learn because you still need to take care of the training by yourself. And if you were to use the rule induction, the C5 program, which was written in C++, we really have no out-of-the-box way to run it on the cloud. If we were to do this, we would probably package it into a Docker container, run on Google Container Engine with Kubernetes, but this will require a lot of work from us, a lot of fine-tuning. So given all of that information, we made a cons conscious de decision that we will sacrifice explainability for now. So it's not that we don't care about it, but to get us faster to production, we'll start with something which is easy to deploy to the cloud. And since neural nets are easy to deploy and still have pretty good accuracy, this is what we went for. All right, so we have chosen the ML model. It's now time to train it. And here's how the training pipeline looks like on a high level. So we have events that I told you about before, so each corresponds to the single change to the business state of the application. Out of those, we need to extract meaningful information. For example, how many failed transactions did this customer have in the past? And for that, we used primarily BigQuery. So we wrote SQL queries that transform this data and stored them in BigQuery as a set of tables. At some point, we um, saw that those SQL became hard to manage. So that's we decided to rewrite some of those transformations into a, a data flow, again, using Apache Beam. And when we have all of this in uh, BigQuery, we can just run CloudML training and obtain a trained model. Of course, in the machine learning, it's very rare case that you just train a model once and deploy. Usually, what you do is you refresh the model. And to do that, you need some way to schedule and orchestrate your training pipeline. When we started with GCP five years back, there was no out-of-the-box solution ready in Google Cloud Platform, so we wrote our own. We called it Query Manager, and it's an App Engine application that takes care of all of that. Fortunately for you, if you're start, starting right now, there is now hosted um, Apache Airflow, uh, which goes by the name Google Cloud Composer. It's currently in beta, but I highly encourage you to go and try it out. So what we do, we schedule our training pipeline to run daily, and each day we have a fresh model. And the one piece left uh, is that we need to serve this model in real time. So let's see how we do this exactly. Just to recall, this is where we want to be. Order management application, as you, as you remember, sends a customer ID and order detail to fraud service, and fraud service returns probability of this order being fraudulent. How do we connect that with cloud machine learning? One idea is maybe the fraud service will just send the features to cloud machine learning in real time, 
it will get a response and it will just pass it back to your order management. The one problem here is that fraud service doesn't know all the features at this point. So it knows what's the current order of the customer, but it doesn't know what was the past behavior of the customer. So we, we need to somehow obtain this data. If you recall, we have already calculated all of this in BigQuery. So we have all the uh, features about the past behavior of the customer ready sitting there in BigQuery. So maybe we'll just make fraud service uh, call to call uh, BigQuery, get the data for this particular customer, and then combine it with uh, current order data and pass it along to cloud machine learning. Again, the one problem for that uh, is BigQuery was not really designed for random access patterns. Going to BigQuery, finding a row corresponding to particular customer would be extremely inefficient, and we cannot afford to do this. What we need is some kind of a persistent cache that will sit between BigQuery and the fraud service. So what we used, we used Google Data Store. Google Data Store is no SQL document database, so you put entities there uh, with no schema. You can easily uh, search for them. You can ha have SQL-like queries over them. But we don't really use all of those um, features. What we do is we use Google uh, Data Store as a key value store. So we put the data about customers uh, as a key value purse. Key is a customer ID, and the value is all the features for this customer. So now, uh, how do we populate the data store? We simply extended the training pipeline. So when the features are cal calculated, we also use a Google Data Flow to transport these features from BigQuery to Data Store. And this is done in Dataflow with Apache Beam again. Uh, since Apache Beam already has connectors to BigQuery and Data Store writing a program which uh, does this data transformation was really easy. It's just 40 or 50 lines of code. And it runs in a batch mode and transports the data to a data store. If we combine all the pieces together, training and serving, this is what we end up with. If you look at the bottom, at the serving part, we ha again have order management sending current features to a fraud service, which calls data store to obtain the past features. Then it combines it and pass along to CloudML, get a response back. So uh, this is how it works. And we, are, we were pretty happy with this architecture. The one problem here is that the data store is populated every day, right? It's not populated every few seconds, only when the training pipeline runs. So again, the problem that Laurent described when a fraudster steals a credit card and she or he will try to put many transactions in a tiny uh, time window, we will simply not notice this behavior in our features. So we had to do a little hack and this is the final architecture for serving that is working on production right now. So fraud service now gets the data from order management of current order. It gets past features one day old from a data store, but it also queries other microservices for the latest data about the customer. So it's all done in real time. And only then fraud service combines all of this, sends um, request to cloud machine learning and gets response back. All right, this is how our architecture looks like. And now, Laurent, can you tell us a bit more about the results that we've got? Sure. Thank you, Przemek. That's great. Basically, we have all what we need to run machine learning on the cloud. I can start with simple feature engineering in Google BigQuery, my, where my uh, data lies, uh, extract uh, some simple feature like counting the, the, the past behavior of a customer, joining some uh, tables. If I need to do more complex data processing, I can use Google Apache Beam in Google Dataflow. For example, normalization, I have to do a loop on all my columns. Uh, compute the average and standard deviation on numerical columns to compute my normalized uh, values. On categorical features, do some transformation like 
um, one hot encoding, for example, or just associate uh, integers to the, um, the categories. And yeah, these, these are some processing that would have been too complicated to do in standard SQL, and with Google Dataflow, it's, it's easy. Next step, I can use Data Store as a fast data access to expose uh, my pre-computed feature that I will then use at serving time. I use Google Cloud ML Engine to do my training of machine learning models. And OK, let's use uh, neural networks. That is a, a good conscious decision to go uh, quickly uh, on production and, and, and uh, get the best of uh, all what is uh, offered us by uh, Google Cloud. Once I have trained my model, I can easily expose it, again, through Google Cloud ML Engine API, and combine it with uh, what I, pre uh, I exposed in data store of my pre-computed feature. I can now run my prediction of fraud detection in real time. So that's really great. And we are reaching really great results with, uh, with all this. Obviously, if you can imagine, uh, if you compare the machine learning algorithms uh, with the neural nets, with the initial uh, solution that we had of handmade rules, the, the results are, are really, uh, really better. Uh, when I say predictive per performance, sorry, it's not about accuracy because hopefully failed payment is a rare event. Uh, imagine you have one fraud out of 100 uh, orders. Uh, if you use accuracy to uh, compute your predictive performance, a model that would just say nothing is fraud would have 99% accuracy. So in this uh, kind of uh, unbalanced class problem, we use other measures like F-score or area under the rock curve that try to find a trade-off between uh, precision and recall. Recall being uh, the percentage of real fraud that your algorithm managed to identify and precision being among the one that uh, he identified as fraud, what's the percentage of right prediction in this one. With machine learning, uh, we also gain adaptability. We can relearn regularly our models and take into account the new behavior of, of uh, fraud, uh, fraudsters. And yeah, we are uh, taking the best of uh, the cloud here and uh, we are already uh, ready to scale with all this architecture. Okay, so now we have uh, a great um, system to predict if an order will be fraudulent or not. What do we do with that? What is the final decision that we take? Easily, if uh, the order is identified as non-fraudulent, you can just let him go through and uh, avoid friction with the customer. This is something that Okado really uh, valorates is um, just accept the delivery and just accept that the payment will be done afterwards because it's, it's good for the customer and it's also easier to handle when you have some uh, product substitution because what you asked uh, two weeks ago is, is not there so we propose you something else and uh, yeah, it's, it's easier to, to handle like that and it's customer friendly. On the other hand, if the uh, algorithm says that an order is probably fraudulent, what do, we do, what do you do with that? One possibility is trigger pre-authorization on the credit card. So you reserve the amount of uh, the order uh, in advance and to ensure that the, 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 the customer will have uh, the money uh, at delivery time. You can also uh, ask a fraud agent to look at the order and take the final decision. And this is where explanation uh, comes back. If you can explain that uh, you think this order is um, suspicious for the content of the basket or the past behavior of the customer or the payment methods used, you can uh, give this to the fraud agent. And yeah, if you want to take this uh, final decision of canceling an order automatically for legal reason, you have to be able to explain. So yeah, basically, I just presented you the, the good result that we obtain on fraud detection. Uh, I'm happy to announce that on the other uh, projects that we are running, uh, product recommendation, demand forecasting, and product recognition, we are also reaching rich, really good results with an architecture that is generic enough to be used uh, in the same way on different projects. 
So yeah, basically, big data, machine learning, made easy on the cloud. Thank you, Google. What's next? Before taking some ideas and questions from you, uh, some hints. Uh, we started to play with Google Data Prep that helped you pre-visualize the data, and we find that uh, this, this product is, is really promising. On the other uh, edge of the pipeline, uh, Google Data Studio uh, is, is, a, is a great solution to monitor our machine learning, basically uh, plot the evolution of our precision and recall of our models. And there is one work that we have started with the Google SRE team to specify some uh, service level indicators and service level objective to ensure the reliability of our whole system. It's also, also great. Thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs>